Good afternoon. I'm here with Tom Magnanti, the 1999 president of Informs. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, maybe let's start and just hear a little bit about yourself, what you've been up to, maybe some of the work you're currently working on, and, and a little bit about around the time you were Informs president. Well, thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure to be with you. This is uh, really a momentous occasion, the 25th anniversary of this institution that means so much to all of us. So I'm delighted to participate. So uh, I started my interest in LOR when I was an undergraduate chemical engineering major, and I took a reading course. In the reading course, I, I read a book on linear programming by Saul Gass, and that changed my life. Uh, I, 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 fell in love, I fell in love with linear programming, uh, and it's been a big part of my life ever since. Then I went on to Stanford, to the dream team of faculty at that time at Stanford, and did my thesis under the innovative pioneer, George Danzig, and actually had the great computer scientist, Donald Knuth, on my committee as well. So it was a really memorable, wow. a memorable experience. I then joined MIT, where I've since, since we spent all of my professional life. I'll tell you a little bit about some other things I did. And at MIT, I did the usual things faculty do. I, I taught anything from undergraduates up to senior executives, mm -hmm. did research, went to conferences, did some administration and all. Uh, but I, I did do a fair amount of administration. I'll just sort of talk to that a bit. So at one time, I was the head of about a third of the Sloan School of Management, so oh. it's an area called the Management Science Area, which mm -hmm. had OR, M, uh, OR, Operations Management, Marketing, uh, information technology, and also accounting at that time. Uh, I also was uh, the co-director of the Operations Research Center for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, after that, uh, I started two programs between the School of Engineering and the School of Management, uh, one called Leaders for Manufacturing, which is now called the Leaders yes. for Global Operations. Uh, that program did a lot to make my life, actually. And another called Systems Design and Management, another joint mm -hmm. program between the two schools. Uh, after that, uh, through a variety of circumstances, I became Dean of Engineering. So I was both at the Sloan School of Management and also in engineering. Uh, and uh, uh, after that, I was pretty heavily involved in some programs in Singapore. So MIT has had three major programs in Singapore. One called the Singapore MIT Alliance, which is an mm -hmm. research program with the National University of Singapore and uh, NTU. Uh, and that program reported to me. So I used to go over once or twice a year. Oh. Uh, then there was a program called SMART, Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology, which built a research campus for sort of prestigious foreign universities. And MIT was the anchor client for that. And wow. I, was, I was the founding director. Mm -hmm. And then MIT helped us establish a new university in Singapore called the Singapore University of Technology and Design, which has an unusual structure and unusual approach to research and all. And I was the founding president. So for 11 years, I think except for one month, I commuted between uh, Cambridge, Mass and Singapore every month. Wow. It's two, wow. two days a month. It's a month a year in an airplane. So yeah. I, I was like a, a traveling salesman of sorts in terms, mm -hmm. of, in terms of doing it. So those were among my sort of administrative responsibilities uh, at MIT. Along the way, I, I spent um, uh, two, two uh, times I spent time at CORE, Center for Operations Research and Ectometrics in Belgium. Okay. Uh, and also was on the... Um, uh, staff for once one semester at digital equipment, the manufacturing staff. Mm -hmm. I was also uh, worked with Sabre Technology Solutions, American uh, Airlines Sabre Technology Solutions. So I, I got a little bit of exposure to uh, practice as well through through these. You have a great mix. Yeah, great is, mix. It, was, it was a nice mix. And a very mm -hmm. nice. So that's sort of the, my my general background. I you know I've written a couple of books and I've done a variety of things that we all do as academics in some ways. So uh, now to get back to sort of Orsa, Tim's, Informs and all, uh, I've done a few things for those. I, I, uh, you know, I attend meetings and organize sessions and all that type of thing. But the first sort of, I think, significant thing that I did administratively, I was the chair of the Education and Student Affairs Committee. 
and created okay. what we call the Doctoral Colloquium. This was uh -huh. back in the early 1980s. And uh, I think it still exists today in various forms and it's been mm -hmm. expanded in terms of practice, colloquium and other things. But it was a great opportunity. About 30 to 40 students would come from, one from each university, spend time with both practitioners and academics and learn about professional life uh, as a practitioner, learn about how to publish a paper, how to work with editors, things like tenure and all these type of things. But it was really great. I, I went for the about first four or five years I went to that event. Uh, it was, it was Believe it or not, I am speaking on a panel for that event in right. two weeks. Fantastic. Right. Well, I hope you enjoy it. I, I really enjoyed it. A lot. Oh, yeah. I've done it many times, but yes, uh, still great, alive and strong. Yeah, it's a great opportunity for these young people to uh, meet with senior people and also develop a community among themselves. And mm -hmm. many of them will say years later, I'm met so-and-so at the colloquium of friend and we've made friends all these years. It's quite remarkable. Uh, then I was, I was editor of operations research for five years. And when I became editor, there were concerns that the journal uh, was, wasn't very accessible, was too theoretical in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made a number of significant changes. Uh, we actually changed the format to go from a smaller format to a larger format. But we created something called the section called OR Practice, in which practitioners could publish their papers. Something called OR Form, where people could write perspective pieces on you know, what's happening mm -hmm. in uh, the internet and social media, these type of things. And another section called In This Issue, which were short paragraphs mm -hmm. that told a little bit about what each article was about and tried to link them to practice. Uh, and I, I actually wrote many of those In This Issue things. But as a crazy person, in some ways, we're all crazy in some ways, uh, for the five years that I was editor, I copy edited every single is issue. Wow, wow. And I think if I weren't uh, an operations researcher, management scientist, I'd have been a copy editor. I actually quite enjoy it. <laughs> huh. uh, so so I, I did that. Uh, then I became president of ORSA, this was in 1988. And, uh, when I was becoming president, I, I, you know, I'd spent the year before as president-elect, and it was clear to me that by that time, Orsa and Tim's had come very, become very close. You know, originally they had sort of separated in a ways, uh, and most of the meetings were uh, going back and forth between the two councils. So something would come up, it'd go to one council, then it'd go to the other for a review, and then go back to the other one comments, then back and forth, et cetera. And it seemed a little crazy to me. So the year I was president, we confirmed the first joint committee of the two councils. Okay. And some people view that as a precursor to the merger. That it was bringing mm -hmm. the two societies sure. together, and re recognizing that they were they were pretty similar in a variety of ways. So that was that. As, as uh, you mentioned before, I participated in a number of other things. Uh, uh, the Edelman contest had an event. And uh, I was the host, I think, or speaker at one of the first of those events. And mm -hmm. that, was, that was great fun as well. So, you know, we've all done many things with the society. So then in 1999, I became uh, president of um, Informs. And uh, when I became president, uh, and actually before that, I had been hearing a lot from people. Uh, we had been having two sort of annual meetings a year. And originally, I think one was for sort of more focused than Orsa, one more focused than Tim's. But by that time, they were basically the same, two meetings. Mm -hmm. And many other meetings had popped up. So there were meetings of, uh, in, within Informs, there was meetings on uh, about manufacturing, uh, meetings on finance, meetings on marketing. And there are many professional meetings outside that were of interest to people in computer science, in application areas such as uh, uh, air transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And a number of people said they just couldn't go to two meetings a year. I mean, just right. too much of the national meetings. So uh, we decided uh, when I was president that we would go to one meeting a year, one annual mm -hmm. meeting, and create something called the practice meeting. So the, the annual meeting, as we all know, is fairly comprehensive, but it tends to be uh, have a lot of academic influence to it. And so we wanted also to have this practice meeting uh, so that the practitioners would have a meeting that was really anchored for them. And it's now become the business analytics meeting, so it's transformed over time. Uh, but uh, but when uh, we start, started that, the largest meeting Informs ever had before that was one in Washington, 
with 2,879 people attending. And the meetings twice a year used to have anywhere from about 1,100 to 2,400 people, but most of them were in the area of 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, that type of thing. Uh, some, some sites like Washington would get a lot because there's a lot of walk-in people. Mm -hmm. from uh, so we decided to do this annual meeting and Tom Gulledge was the chair of the meetings committee at the time. And we did this analysis and we determined if we could get 2,400 people a year to go to the annual meeting, mm -hmm. uh, it would be financially viable. So we launched it. And I think the first year we had 1,300, then 1,500, that type of thing. Now it routinely gets 5,000 or more people. Yes. The Seattle meeting almost had 7,000 people. Mm -hmm. So in some ways it's been a great success. It's become yeah. the rail, rallying point, I think, for the profession in many ways. And I think the practice meeting, you know, analytics meetings, I think become quite a success as well. Oh yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I'm, I'm actually quite proud that we established those uh, under this time of leadership. Well, that's good, I love hearing the history. Yeah. Um, a fairly auspicious time then as these were all converging. And But when you think about actually the discipline itself around yeah. ORMS, what would become sort of analytics, yeah. what was happening at that time? Kind of what was the sentiment around it? Um, what kind of traction were we getting? What was the balance sort of of theory and practice? What was your perspective? Well, when, when, I, when I did my PhD, this is late 60s, early 70s, uh, I think the profession had really anchored a lot on theory at that point. And many people mm -hmm. were doing theory, developing great, I think, uh, algorithms and theories and things, uh, but wasn't as much touched with practice in some ways. I think it was, there was practice in terms of people were using it. And mm -hmm. of course, the oil companies were using it, others were using it, the airlines were starting to use it, et cetera, et cetera. Finance people were starting to use it. Uh, but then over time, uh, we, uh, we began to change in many ways. Uh, I think one, we, we now have, a th I think we have a balance now between theory and applications. Uh, I think we see that at the universities. Uh, in, in many ways, I could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, of course, we've had this enormous transition in terms of computational power, data and anal analytics, uh, available data. Uh, enormous cont contributions in terms of algorithms that uh, uh, when I started, we could, you had to put in punch cards overnight. You could mm -hmm. do one, one run a night. And if your so-called job control language was wrong, you got nothing done that night, right? And so that's how we used to do our computations back then. Uh, now, of course, you just push a button and your, your uh, laptop computer runs these big programs that we have in some ways. Uh, so I think things have changed in terms of the access to data um, and also the sort of ar areas of influence. In the first doctoral colloquium, uh, many of the students at that time had an interest in queuing and stochastic processes. By the fourth or fifth one, it seemed like everybody was doing integer programming and combinatorial optimization. So these were fads, fads I think within the academic community, fads uh -huh. within the profession. And I think we see this now. So lots of people are doing uh, work on social networking, internet, uh, and various arenas in terms of marketing, finance, operations, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the nice things about the profession, I think Mike Thomas, uh, a very famous operations teacher from Georgia Tech, once said that um, operations research was a, a, was a liberal education in the technological world. In, in the sense that we we did most everything, uh, we you yeah. know we touched about almost every yeah. field endeavor. Uh, we had a set of tools which was pretty applicable across enormous of application domains, and I think that's been one been part of the credit to the profession that we've been oh, able to move, move sure. from, from field to field. You know, there's some fields such as uh, uh, manufacturing supply chains we've been doing forever. Uh, and others that we uh, so such as such as analytics the way we think about it now which at least seems new. I, I think some of us in OR would say we've been doing it forever, but to some people it seems new. Uh, but certainly the capabilities of doing that have changed dramatically over time. Now you said that, uh, you know, um, everything that happened around the meetings and that evolution of the meetings was something you were very proud of. Is there anything else during your tenure as president that was really sort of a pinnacle moment for you? Well, we, we uh, 
first of all, I think uh, uh, you know I was president at the time when we were just about to have 2000. Right. Uh, and uh, everyone was concerned that the world was going to collapse. Uh, at that time, uh, Informed was concerned that it was going to collapse. So we had, had to build in all this redundancy in all of our systems and all like. So that was a big issue at that time. And now it turned out, of course, it wasn't, didn't end up being a big issue. But everybody, not just the Informed, everybody everywhere around the world was very concerned about that. So it's a big issue. Um, diversity has always been a big issue. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've always had uh, women participants in the society, but we didn't have many women leaders in the society. Uh, there weren't, uh, there weren't women as presidents of the society, right? And that's changed a lot, I think, over mm -hmm. time. I think that's benefited us greatly in a wide variety of ways. So we were investing in some of those initiatives uh, as, as we were going. Um, you know, mainly the you know one of the jobs of the presidents, as you well know, is just to keep things humming, right? Yes. <laughs> Make sure that the journals get published, that we have good leadership for the journals, we have good leadership for our committees, we initiate new things as we go, and we move into new directions as we go. Uh, but that, uh, and we maintain financial uh, viability in terms of sustainability. And that was, a, that was an issue a, a long, uh, sometimes in the past as well, that the, the societies were quite concerned about their finances. Uh, uh, Tim's, I think at one point, felt that it was going to go broke at one point. Mm -hmm. And Orsa wasn't far behind in that. And so there were issues in terms of how we, how we uh, uh, do that. Uh, there was always issues about also how broad the profession was. Uh, are we, are we uh, OR and MS math people? Or do we do management? Do we do information systems? Do we organizational behavior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I think and, that's an age long question, right? <laughs> and it'll probably be with us forever. Yes. But we do most everything. And I think you notice that in our, in our uh, meetings, that the meetings have uh, sessions and things on almost anything imaginable in some ways, which I think is great, great for us as a profession. Oh, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. So when you think about informs then, and we've had this, you know, fairly illustrious 25 year history of just the, the recent past, where do you think, what are our opportunities moving forward? What do you think we're headed? And maybe what's your one piece of advice for the society, for our, our community as you move forward? Well, I might, I might have two or three, but uh, okay. I'll give you one. So, so one piece of advice is, you know, some people will argue for applications some people will argue for theory, and they'll argue very strongly for one side or the other. I actually think it's important we embrace both. And I think that's part of, part of the strength of society is that we embrace both. I think we have, it's good that we have some people that go to their chalkboard or their paper and do their theory every day and don't care too much about practice. We have some people who do their practice every day and don't care too much about theory, and lots of people in between. Right? And I think it's actually it's important that we have lots of people in between. So one I think is embracing both theory and practice and uh, acknowledging the, that, that, that strength. I think a second is that uh, we need not be isolated. Um, you know, for these programs that I started at MIT, Leaders for Manufacturing and Systems mm -hmm. and Management, they're broad programs between the management school and the engineering school, but they both have strong OR content. Uh, they do optimization, they do supply chains, they do some probability and statistics and these type of things. And I think we should be involved in programs like that. Uh, we, we should be involved in programs in healthcare, problems in finance. Uh, so bring our, and that doesn't mean that they're necessarily OR problems or MS problems per se, but these broader problems that we can contribute in a variety of ways. And I, I think we do that through practice all the time mm -hmm. in terms of what we do in various organizations. So that, I think that would be a, 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 a sort of a second uh, a thing. Um, I, the third thing would be we should enjoy ourselves. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, this is a great profession. Uh, it's uh, the, the things that we do are, uh, I find exciting, still exciting to an old man as they were when I was a young kid. Uh, and uh, you know, I think the fact that we can it, impact practice uh, make significant impact in terms of uh, how the world runs, how our companies run, how the government runs is important. 
and we can do uh, great theoretical things as well. I think uh, I, I get joy in seeing all of that in some ways. Well, Tom, thank you so much for spending some time with me today and sharing your thoughts. Yes. Uh, I've really appreciated it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for hosting me and thank you for hosting this 25th uh, anniversary celebration for INFORMS. Uh, I think we should all be proud of how far INFORMS has come since its launching 25 years ago. I completely agree. Thank you. Thank you.